Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club. Uh, my name is Monroe Carmen. I'm president of the club and editor at large at Bloomberg Business News. Audio and videotapes of today's luncheons are available by calling 1 800 500 9911. I'd like to welcome everybody, uh, our members and their guests in the audience, as well as those of you watching on C SPAN or listening to this program on National Public Radio or the Global Internet Computer Network. Our uh, debate uh, format today uh, is a little different than our custom. <coughs> We're allowing each speaker eight minutes to set forth her position, followed by a three-minute rebuttal. If you have any questions for our speakers, please write them on the cards at your table, and I will ask as many as time permits. I'd now like to introduce our head table guests and ask them to stand briefly when their names are called. From uh, your right, Kim Masters of the Washington Post. Ellen Devonport of the St. Petersburg Times. Tom Wild, press secretary for the National Rifle Association's Institute for Legislative Action. Steve Green of Copley Newspapers. Norm Rice, the mayor of Seattle, representing the U.S. Conference of Mayors. David Beter, Washington Bureau Chief of the Omaha World Herald. Uh, skipping over our speaker, uh, Mark Johnson, Media General News Service and Chairman of the National Press Club Speakers Committee. Uh, again, skipping over a, a speaker, Vera Glasser, a freelance journalist and member of the Speakers Committee who arranged today's luncheon. Thank you, Vera. Uh, George Mataxa, husband of Mrs. Mataxa. Uh, Owen Altman of uh, Business Week. Uh, Lori Montgomery, Detroit Free Press and Bob Davis of USA Today. <laughs> the subject of today's luncheon is the gun. Here's what the Second Amendment of the U.S. Constitution has to say about the gun. Quote, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed." Unquote. Polls show that some 75 percent of the American people support the right of citizens to keep and bear arms. Polls also show that some 70 percent of the people support the ban on certain assault weapons enacted by Congress and signed into law by President Clinton last year. Today, we will hear from two women, one from each of those camps. Tanya Mataxa is a mother, grandmother, and a competitive shooter. She has devoted most of her working life to guns. In fact, in spelling her name for reporters, she sometimes explains AK, as in AK-47, and SA, as in semi-automatic. Mrs. Mataxa holds a political science degree from Smith College. She heads the legislative arm of the National Rifle Association, which boasts three and a half million members and a lobbying budget of $19 million. In 1980, she served as national chairwoman of sportsmen and conservationists for Reagan Bush. As you all know, former President Bush, a longtime member of the NRA, resigned his membership recently in reaction to an NRA letter that referred to federal agents as jack booted thugs. Over the years, Mrs. Mataxa has been credited with playing a large role in developing the NRA into a major player on the national scene. 
Now, as the NRA prepares for its annual meeting, there are reports of a rift within the organization over what its posture should be in attacking the Brady waiting bill, waiting period bill, excuse me, and the assault weapon ban. Mrs. Metaxa is put in the aggressive camp. Our second speaker, Sarah Kemp Brady, holds a degree from William and Mary College. She's worked as a teacher and for 10 years in various Republican Party capacities. When her husband, James Brady, then press secretary to Ronald Reagan, was shot in an, in an assassination attempt 14 years ago, Mrs. Brady dedicated her life to her husband's recovery, their son, James Brady Jr., and the gun control movement. She chairs Handgun Control, an organization claiming 400,000 members and with a $6 million budget. She also chairs the Center to Prevent Handgun Violence, a sister group that works to reduce gun violence through education, research, and legal advocacy. Her proudest moment came excuse me, on November 30th, 1993. It was then that President Clinton signed into law the Brady Bill, requiring a national waiting period and a background check on all handgun purchases through licensed dealers. The Bradys now are fighting to preserve that law and to fend off efforts to repeal the ban on assault weapons. Mrs. Brady calls America's gun laws simple common sense and the NRA's attack on them as insane. This is only the second time these two women have appeared together on a public platform. The toss of a coin gave the opportunity to speak first to Mrs. Metaxa. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Get rid of that. President Clinton has said that the 1994 gun ban is very effective. His comments are, in my opinion, ludicrous and indefensible. The ban is masking an abysmal record of this administration of failing to prosecute federal weapons violations. In the last two years, that prosecution has gone down 23 percent. That's the only way his gun ban is effective. It camouflages a lack of performance. However, I want to talk about words today because that has been a rallying cry in the past several weeks. President Clinton has said, quote, words have consequences, unquote, and he's right. From false cries of fire in a crowded theater to grotesque lies by political opportunists, words do have consequences. Legitimate debate such as this, redress of grievance, and positive social change are also the consequence of words. Words drove election 94 when citizens changed the face of Congress and the state legislatures. For citizen groups like the National Rifle Association, 1994 was unprecedented. Even an astonished Bill Clinton told the Cleveland Plain Dealer, quote, the NRA is the reason the Republicans control the House, unquote. <coughs> After the election, words just didn't defend the Second Amendment rights, but they were used to, adv to advance them. Even Time Magazine tipped its hat to NRA's hand in enacting right to carry laws that ensure honest citizens a means to defend themselves against criminal attack outside their homes. Just this year, right to carry has been signed into law in Virginia, Utah, Idaho, and even in Bill Clinton's home state of Arkansas. It has passed both houses of legislatures in Texas and Oklahoma, and it's moving in Ohio, Michigan, Louisiana, North and South Carolina, and even California. On the federal side, words were the building blocks of a comprehensive Second Amendment education strategy. That strategy, a strategy of words, 
is based not just on scholars finally getting a voice, but ordinary people telling Congress how, have they, how they have used their own privately owned firearms, some banned the year before, to defend self and family. Education built on free speech continues as it must. The fabric of our Constitution, our national political life, even the quality of our life at home and in community are the consequences of words. But if words have consequences, so does an action. In the wake of the tragedy in Waco in April 1993, NRA issued a nationwide press release calling for, quote, thorough and independent, unquote, fact-finding. We called in measured terms for the, quote, full investigation to proceed immediately in court, in Congress, and through the White House. We proposed that President Clinton consider appointing an independent special prosecutor. April 1993, no response, inaction. In January of 1994, NRA formed a coalition with the American Civil Liberties Union and a host of other groups concerned about civil rights. In its letter to the President, the coalition cited numerous cases of alleged civil rights abuses by federal agencies. Only two of those cases dealt with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. Our call to action was as moderate in tone as it was direct. Appoint a national commission to study the cases. Establish the truth. Act on it. January 1995, 1994, no response, inaction. In January of 1995, now a year later, the same coalition met again to reissue that same call, save for a lone meeting with a single Justice Department staffer, no action has been taken. There is absolutely no reason and no justification for the horrific acts of criminal terrorists, and there is no reason for scapegoating, casting about with a broad brush of blame. First of all, it has a chilling effect on First Amendment rights. But there is another morale consequence. Scapegoating gives terrorists a veneer of justification for their unspeakable acts. There is no justification. What they did and what they can do is evil. We all condemn terrorists. We must not condemn legitimate calls by honest citizens engaged exclusively and proudly in our cherished tradition of democratic political action to establish the truth and remedy injustice. For when all the rhetoric from every side is peeled back, dread of government remains. As many as four in 10 Americans reported that they perceive, quote, an immediate threat to their civil liberties from the federal government. Angry white conservative males preaching some zany conspiracy theory? Hardly. More liberals than conservatives reported that fear. And a more recent poll found as many as 52%, 52%, a majority of Americans reporting dread of government. On a vast array of issues, this reflects an ocean of discontent with federal power. Whether it be spirited rhetoric, or the moderate tone adopted in letters to presidents, NRA rhetoric amounts to a rain on that ocean. Instead, a new vigilantism of hate mongering and blamesmanship by political opportunists has victimized honest citizens and their call for action. There is no question that we must fight against criminal terrorists, absolutely no question. But because that is a battle for the safety of our nation, it is also clear that we must fight for freedom from fear because that is a battle to regain the soul of our nation. Full open hearings by a special select committee can help heal, heal that fear. So can respect for due process, redress of grievance, and freedom of speech, which is far more the issue these days than the right to arms. We have a constitution. The NRA supports all 10 of the Bill of Rights, 10 amendments. Let's respect it. Let's support it. We have a participatory democracy. Let's use it. Let's not silence it. Thank you.
Thank you. And now, Mrs. Brady. Good afternoon. I'm extremely pleased to be here again to see a lot of faces here in the audience that I recognize. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Before beginning, I do want to take this opportunity to recognize um, my friend over here, um, Norm Rice, the mayor of Seattle, who is here uh, as vice president of the National Conference of Mayors. And today he has given us a letter which is being sent to Congress by a hundred and assigned by 111 mayors and police chiefs. And this letter calls upon Congress to stop any efforts to repeal or to weaken the Brady Law or the ban on assault weapons. And Norm, I want to thank you for that and for your continual support. Um, a neighbor and a friend of mine also that uh, I want to mention, Mo Udall, uh, said once, uh, and only the way Mo can say things, that campaign finance reform is no sport for the short-winded. And believe you me, I have learned that the fight for responsible gun legislation is also no sport for the short-winded. The debate over gun control has been divisive, but Americans are not evenly divided on this issue. A small number of Americans favor a federal ban on all firearms. We know that. A small number of Americans oppose virtually any restrictions on firearms, whether it be federal, state, or local. But a great majority of all of us, two-thirds to three-fourths of Americans, fall somewhere in the middle ground. I am proud to be included in that group and I'm proud that my organization, Handgun Control, that I chair, is in the middle. We believe that the average citizen should be able to own firearms, whether for hunting or for self-protection, but we support reasonable gun laws aimed at keeping guns out of the wrong hands and making reasonable restrictions on the kinds of firearms that are manufactured and sold in America. That this consens consensus is nothing new. Measures like the Brady Bill and the ban on assault weapons have always enjoyed widespread popular support. A 1990 Gallup poll found that 95% of the respondents favored a waiting period. That's 95%. A 19 89 poll found that three of four Americans favored a ban on the manufacture and sale of semi-automatic assault weapons. If this consensus is so strong, why did it take Congress so long to act? The answer, in part, is that the opponents of gun legislation have been very, very successful at changing the subject. For starters, every proposed gun law, no matter how reasonable, no matter how limited it may be, is always characterized as confiscation. Prior to passage of the, gun, of the Brady Law, gun dealers reported that there was near panic buying of guns by gun collectors. Gun owners were not rushing to beat the five-day waiting period. Some may have been rushing to beat the background check, but most were rushing because they had been told that handgun control, which I chair, and President Clinton were about to ban all guns and they better get out there and get their share early. The gun lobby has continually called us gun grabbers, but the Brady Law did not grab anyone's gun. The Brady Law is just a waiting period and a background check. The federal assault weapon ban did not grab anyone's gun. It simply stopped the manufacture and importation of assault weapons. Anyone who legally owned an assault weapon prior to the bill's enactment can continue to possess it, and it can, they can sell it or transfer it. If the gun-grabbing rhetoric, however, doesn't work, 
if it doesn't frighten enough people, our opponents vigorously insist that what we really need is criminal control, not gun control. Well, of course we need criminal control. Who in the world doesn't believe that? But there is nothing, absolutely nothing inconsistent about fighting crime and criminals on the one hand and fighting to keep guns out of the hands of criminals on the other. If the criminal control argument doesn't work, then we are told that the proposals violate the Second Amendment. But the National Rifle Association doesn't have the courage of its own Second Amendment convictions. The NRA has not filed any Second Amendment challenges to the Brady Law, nor have they challenged the assault weapon ban on the basis of the Second Amendment. And the reason is very clear. No federal court has ever overturned a gun law on the basis of the Second Amendment. In the words of former Chief Justice Warren Burger, the NRA's interpretation of the Second Amendment is a fraud. Our opponents insist that gun laws don't work, but gun laws do work. The Brady Law, we were told, would be a flop. Well, some flop. The Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms estimates that the Brady Law stopped 41,000 felons and other prohibited purchasers in the first year alone. If you then include the states that were already doing background checks, uh, the number rises of prohibited persons to 70,000. As one law enforcement official put it, that's the same as taking 70,000 guns off the street. And the assault weapon ban is working too. And given, it a and given a chance, it will work even better. On September 13th, 1994, domestic assault weapon manufacturers stopped producing 19 assault weapons specifically named in the bill. Ammunition clips holding more than 10 rounds, and firearms containing more than one assault weapon feature. Given a chance to work, the assault weapon ban will reduce the firepower of criminals and save our lives. After President Bush banned the importation of assault rifles in 1989, the number of imported assault rifles traced to crime dropped by 45% following the following year. Critics of the ban insist that the manufacturers are making only cosmetic changes to the guns, and that's simply wrong. Manufacturers are reducing folding stocks, the pistol grips, and most importantly, the large capacity ammunition clips. Those are important changes. Those are not cosmetic changes. Critics of the ban say that these weapons are still for sale. Yes. In some cases, those manufactured prior to September 13th of 1994 are still for sale. But the prices of these grandfathered weapons have risen sharply, and over time, the inventories of these weapons will be exhausted. We just have to give it a chance to work. Finally, when all else fails, our opponents resort to hysteria. Last week, Guns and Ammo magazine released an article by Congressman Steve Stockman in which he declares that the Waco raid was the product of a conspiracy hatched by President Clinton, Sarah Brady, and handgun control. He even goes so far as to suggest that Attorney General Janet Reno should be put on trial for premeditated murder. He should be ashamed of himself. He owes the American people an apology. <clears throat> what happened in Oklahoma City a few weeks ago was a national disaster. It's impossible for any of us to imagine so much bloodshed. But let me end up by saying, every day in this nation, we see violence of an unprecedented amount. 103 people every day are killed by gun violence. It's time. 
that we did something about this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Brady. Now, ma'am, your turn for a rebuttal to this, three minutes at most. Mrs. Brady just said, called and said that NRA and gun owners live in a world that appears to be worried about the banning of firearms, not only specific firearms, but all firearms. It's interesting to note, and I'm going to give you a quote, that Mrs. Brady was on Broadcast House Live on March 7th, 1995. And she said, quote, we need to get guns out of all the homes, unquote. As a gun owner, I'm, I'm sure that she meant all the homes because she said it. That means my home. That means your home. That means 3.5 million Americans who belong to the NRA's home. These people who belong to the NRA and who own guns in this, in this country, after all, 50% of, of all the homes in America has a gun in it, are basically law-abiding citizens. I like to say they're 99 and 44, 100 percent pure, just like ivory soap. What do we mean when we say we're going to get the guns out of all the homes? And how is that to be affected? After the Brady Law passed, a very jubilant Congressman Schumer, flanked by members of HCI, said, well, the NRA was right. They said it was just the nose of the camel under the tent. And now we're going to show you what the rest of the camel looks like. And the rest of the camel includes what's commonly called now as Brady II. And Brady II includes licensing, registration, the ability not to have more than one or two guns in your home. If you do, you have to get what's called a, quote, arsenal, unquote, license. Now, it's in an interesting comment that we're talking about reasonable gun laws. Let's talk about the ban on a so-called assault weapons, or as I like to call it, the Clinton gun ban. One of the protected guns in the Clinton gun ban was the 1860 Henry lever action rifle. It's specifically listed as one of those that are a protected firearm. Yet, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms halted its importation, citing the Clinton gun ban as its authority under the law. If you can ban guns, you protect from banning. What does this say about this law that we maintain is poorly worded and vague? When the Brady Bill was in conference in late 1993, Sarah Brady and HCI opposed a measure to mandate a check of 18 million criminal history records and impose a mandatory mental health check. That was our alternative, and we call it instant check. It's working in states, and every time we try to get this implemented at the state legislature, who is opposing us? The criminals? No. They know they can go get a gun from wherever they want to illegally at any time. No, it's the good folks from HCI. They don't want to replace a three-day waiting period or a five-day waiting period with an instant check that works extremely well in Virginia, works extremely well in Delaware, and this year in Georgia it was signed into law after the Atlanta Constitution proceeded to write editorial after editorial after editorial. But the legislature and the governor of Georgia 
passed this law, and now the citizens will be able to go into their gun stores, have an instant check, pick up their gun, and the whole state will be Im Im imminently safer than the three-day waiting or five-day waiting period. The NRA believes in government. We work in the governmental process. We work in the legislatures, and we work through the political process. And we're working very hard for all those households who own a gun, 50% of the households in this country, so the guns cannot be taken out of all the homes. Mr. Brady, your turn at rebuttal. Three minutes, please. First of all, I guess maybe I ought to talk a little bit about instant background checks. Yes, they are working in Virginia and in Delaware. I don't believe they're going to work in Georgia. And the reason we have opposed instantaneous background checks is we feel that in order to purchase a weapon, the very best background check ought to be done. And most states in this nation have not upgraded their criminal record histories to the point where an instantaneous background check can be done. It takes time, in many cases, to run a criminal background check in which you really are going to be effective. And that is our reason. You can't just vote in an instantaneous background check when the resources are not available. Yes, Brady, t Brady worked to get over-the-counter sales of guns to the wrong hand stopped. And if you can't stop them over the counter like that, how are you going to stop any form of uh, keeping them out of the hands of fugitives or felons? Which is why, yes, we have advocated Brady too. Uh, the same principle as when we try and cut down on automobile deaths and injuries, we pass speed limits. Now, speed limits alone are not going to stop all traffic injuries and deaths, but we wouldn't want to rescind speed limits. That's part of the equation. You need other parts of the equation. And through the years, we have treated deaths and injuries with automobiles in a public safety way that we know will work. It's a group of laws working together that will keep down the death and injuries by automobiles. The same is true with firearms injuries and death. That is our purpose at handgun control, is to cut down, indeed cut down on the number of deaths and injuries. Stopping, keeping guns out of the wrong hands will help. Our next step, of course, is to keep them out of the underground market. And we've done that through a variety of methods as well. One gun a month is in Virginia. Uh, Gun traffickers can no longer go into the state of Virginia and purchase hundreds of weapons at one time and sell them immediately in Washington, D.C. or the streets of New York. We must see that that's done nationwide so that this booming business of gun trafficking doesn't provide an underground market for gun sales. There are lots of parts of the equation in order to save lives and deaths and anything that we as a nation can do without interfering with the ability of uh, aver the average citizen who is not prohibited, <coughs> then we must take these steps. It is an, an epidemic in this nation today where 103 people a day die, 15 kids a day die. And we must take responsibility. Education also is a large part of it. And we must teach parents that children, that guns must be kept out of the hands of children. And that parents must take responsibility in their homes. Which is why we have uh, pushed for child accident prevention laws, making the adults responsible. That a gun in the home is 43 times more likely to be misused than it is to be used effectively in fending off an intruder. And it is a ticking time bomb for children. 
So we would hope that all Americans, when they go to purchase that gun for their home, look at the facts. We don't want to take away that ability, but through educating the American public and through good common sense laws, I am convinced we can begin to save lives. And after all, that's what it's all about, saving lives and cutting down on the injury rate. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, all right, if you'll be seated, let's see. We'll start with a question for Mrs. Metaxa. It's been reported, uh, I think in at least two places, that you met with members of the Michigan militia earlier this year. Could you please explain the details of your meeting and have you or any other NRA leader had similar contacts with other militia groups? Well, it's been reported in some circles that we had a secret meeting. I'd venture to tell you that the secret meeting was held in the lobby bar of the Radisson Hotel in Lansing, Michigan. They requested a meeting. I happened to be in the area, and I said, sure, we'll sit down and talk. They told us their philosophy. We told them ours. They were at great divergence, I'd say 180 degrees apart. We finished the discussion about differing philosophies, and they left saying three times that they were very disappointed about the meeting. Uh, I have no knowledge of any other NRA official uh, meeting with any militia groups, uh, and I have not met with them since, nor have I talked to them since. Uh, Mrs. Metoxa, uh, I, I'm gonna keep you hopping, both of you, I promise. Uh, Governor Lawton Ch uh, Childs of Florida, when he was here recently, said that when he was a freshman co uh, in Congress, the NRA opposed putting identifying tagants in fertilizers used for explosives. Is that true, and what is your position now on tagants? I don't know what Governor Childs said, but let me tell you our position on tagants then and our position on tagants now. In the late 70s and early 80s, there were some bombings that you all remember uh, that happened uh, across some college campuses. And there was an effort to figure out how to stop or deter this. One of the suggestions was by 3M Company that made a, a plastic uh, or some kind of metallic ceramic little chip that they wanted to put into uh, explosives, into fertilizer, and other things. The NRA has no position on tagants and fertilizer. That's for the fertilizer industry. We don't know a thing about fertilizer. We have no position on tagants and explosives. We're not the explosive in industry or a representative thereof. Our concern with tagants was to put it in smokeless and black powder. These are the powders that are used in the making of ammunition. Our concern was one of safety. When you have powder in such minute amounts in bullets and cartridges, any addition of anything that is foreign to it can cause a safety hazard. And after testing, it was found that the tagants of that era would cause a safety problem and could start fires if left in ammunition. That's why we opposed it. As far as our position is today, we're in the process of reevaluating our position. The first two positions on explosives and on fertilizers still stand. We're looking at what advances, if any, have been made uh, in the uh, manufacture of so-called tagants to see how our position shapes up on that issue. Can I sit down? Yeah. <laughs> For Mrs. Brady. Uh, critics of the assault weapon ban claim that the law is so poorly written that it is meaningless. As manufacturers find ways to retrofit we weapons to move around the law, has it lost its teeth? Is it really just a symbolic legislation? No, absolutely not. And I, I think as I addressed in my regular remarks, that uh, although 
Our opponents will say that changes are made, uh, and a slight changes and then it's back out on the street again. Those are the cosmetic changes. But the important thing is, it is the large capacity magazines, the folding stocks, um, the flash suppressors are not being manufactured and are not, these weapons are not going out in that form anymore and those are the important uh, teeth in that legislation. Most importantly, the large capacity magazines uh, limiting uh, the weapon, uh, the magazine size to 10 or less. This weapon, I mean this law, given a chance to work, will work. It's an excellent law. Is any law perfect? No. But this is a very well thought out one that took a lot of years and a lot of work on the part of law enforcement, legislators, uh, specialists from around the country in putting together a law that could be effective and it will, it is beginning to be effective and it will be effective. Well, before you leave, you can answer a similar question on the Brady Law. At least two federal judges have ruled the Brady Law unconstitutional, though leaving the waiting period intact. Is that law now meaningless? Absolutely not. As I said, 70,000, uh, 41,000 as a result of only the Brady Law. 70,000 people last year alone were stopped. Uh, opponents to the Brady Law have brought suit, and more than two, I believe it's six, perhaps more now, um, areas throughout the country uh, on the Tenth Amendment, in which case, on, on, in several cases, uh, uh, that has been upheld and, and the background check aspect has been cut out. The waiting period still remains, uh, which is a sad commentary because those folks now are having to wait five days but don't get the benefit of the background check. Uh, we do expect, as this moves through the courts, that uh, that it will not hold up. But most importantly, through 99% of the country, background checks are being conducted and, uh, and, are, and those background checks are, are working as, as you have heard. Thank you. Now for Mrs. Metaxa. What are you hearing about the timing of the assault weapons repeal vote? Have uh, Senator Dole or Speaker Gingrich given personal assurances to bring a vote? And what is your prediction as to the outcome of that vote if and when it occurs? I expect a vote in the House sometime this year. Uh, I can't tell you what the vote would be. After all, she'd know then. Um, but, uh, Yes, we've talked to leadership of both the Senate and the House, and we expect a vote. And the no, I'll, I'll. <laughs> Mrs. Brady, someone asked if you could tell G. Gordon Liddy something, <laughs> what would it be? <laughs> oh, I could think of a lot of things I'd like to say to G. Gordon Liddy. <laughs> but. I, I think maybe the one thing I might like to tell him is that uh, my father, Vera knows, knew my dad well, was a FBI agent. And my dad, like millions or hundreds of thousands of federal law enforcement officers, was a fine person. He was no jack booted thug, I'll tell you that. And if he were alive today, he would be irate at the kind of rhetoric that people like this are spreading. Uh, Mrs. Metax, uh, I'm sorry, forgive me, I stumbled there. Uh, Representative Steve Stockman of Texas, uh, who the uh, NRA worked to elect and who sits on the Speaker's Task Force on Firearms, wrote in the June <coughs> Guns and Ammo magazine that the Waco episode was, quote, encouraged, unquote, by uh, the federal government to build, help build the case for gun control legislation. Do you agree with that and should Representative Stockman remain on the task force? <coughs> Thank you. 
Well, let me first uh, take the, the writer of the question to task. Um, NRA did not work to help elect Mr. Stockman. We were neutral in that race, um, number one. Number two, um, I have no knowledge uh, of what Mr. Stockman writes about. Uh, I was not consulted on his article. Uh, and what was the third part of that uh, question? Um, should he re be allowed to remain on that committee? I think that uh, is up to the uh, House leadership because the person who appointed him to that task force certainly was not me. Uh, it was the speaker. Mrs. Brady, should more emphasis be placed on enforcement of existing laws, namely tough mandatory jail sentences. No exceptions, the writer asks, for any crime committed with a firearm. We have uh, long supported, and I have long supported mandatory sentencing for um, any crime when a gun is used in the commission of that crime. We like to put, as well as punishment after the crime, our main emphasis is on prevention. Let's stop that crime with a gun before it ever begins. That's the best way possible to begin to save lives. Since the 1980s, the mid-1980s, the NRA has lost the support of major, most major police organizations. Has the organization become more radical, quote unquote, or uncompromising in recent years? And uh, corollary question, there is speculation that the aggressive faction will try to take over the leadership of the NRA at its annual meeting soon. Please comment. Uh, the first part was about... Uh, Have you become more radical? No, you know it was about major police organizations. Major police organizations. NRA has always been pro-police. Uh, we've had uh, hundreds of thousands of law enforcement officers go through our training programs, and we maintain our training pro programs to date, and they still come through our training programs. We have lots and lots of police from the federal, state, and local agencies who are NRA members. As a matter of fact, we had a hearing on Capitol Hill in early April at which rank and file police officers were finally given an opportunity to testify as to their feelings on banning guns and the Second Amendment. We are pro-police. We are pro-government. The major police organizations have now become politicized, and the police chiefs are appointed by the mayors city councils of their respective uh, jurisdictions. And I think as a result of this politicizing, you see them doing what is commonly known as being politically correct. After all, their jobs are on the line. But the rank and file police, I maintain, are in favor of their rights to own firearms. And I just heard about one today who uh, testified in a, uh, at, its, at the state level that all of a sudden, once he retired, he was not able to keep his gun. He didn't have his badge anymore, and now he felt alone and vulnerable. And that's why he testified on behalf of right to carry. Now the second half of the uh, question. I get these double hitters all the time, don't Sorry. I? Uh, second half is about uh, militants and mil militancy within the NRA. Uh, there was an article in the Washington Post about a week ago, which I'm sure that the writers are referring to. There is no militancy uh, within the NRA that isn't supported by all the officers. I think if you read yesterday's Washington Post and other major newspapers, you'll see a rather long, lengthy letter written by President Tom Washington. I predict that our board meeting that starts, that's a week from to yesterday, that the, Mr. Washington will be reelected, the two vice presidents will be reelected, Mr. LaPierre will be reelected, and the election will be very boring. 
the allegations have been made by some people who have tried to run for our board of directors. And as all organizations are, we have a spirited uh, election process every year. A third of our board is up for re-election. And during that time, there are allegations thrown around and, and political speech is prevalent. The people who throw the allegations out didn't get, didn't get elected. So I think you're going to see the NRA stick with its officers, stick with its CEO, and go on about our business. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Brady, uh, a recent handgun control fundraising letter talked about terrorists using assault weapons. Isn't this an, an, an attempt to tie the Oklahoma City bombing to efforts to repeal the gun ban? Is that fair? Well, I think it, 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 it came home to a lot of us um, after Oklahoma City that uh, something that we knew before Oklahoma City, that assault weapons shouldn't be in the hands of anyone. Certainly shouldn't be in the hands of gang members or kids or anybody who might use them, such as on the Long Island ra uh, Railroad, or terrorists. These are weapons of war. And to deny the fact that these weapons shouldn't be in the hands of anybody. These are weapons of war. Uh, I don't think that is taking advantage of any situation. It's reality, and it's the same thing we've been saying since 1989 when we began to wage this war against the military-style assault weapon. Mrs. Metaxa, in the light of the fact that numerous surveys have shown that a majority of American gun owners support both the Brady Law and the Assault Weapons Law, how can the NRA justify its c continuing opposition to this legislation, especially since the organization claims to be the voice of American gun owners? Let me just say a, little word, a few words about assault weapons following uh, Mrs. Brady's comments. The NRA doesn't want any guns in the hands of kids. The gun laws that are now on the books say that you can't purchase a firearm unless you're 18, a rifle, and that you can't purchase a handgun unless you're 21. This is federal law. We support that law. We have always supported that law. Now let me tell you something. The problem is that that law, the 1968 Gun Control Act, and its amendments in 1986 are not being enforced. That's what I talked about when I said a 23% decline in federal prosecutions. People who shouldn't have guns, felons in possession, are not being prosecuted. We support taking felons with guns off the streets. Mrs. Brady talks about weapons of war. That's, that's the idea behind calling semi-automatic firearms assault weapons. These are not weapons of war. The military doesn't use the guns that the, were banned under the Clinton gun ban. These are semi-automatic firearms that fire exactly the same way as the guns that they protected in that piece of legislation. They don't fire any faster. They don't make more noise. They don't make bigger holes. These are straight, semi-automatic rifles. And she talks about cosmetics. All the cosmetics she talks about don't change the characteristics of the firearm. A pistol grip has no functionality except when a man who has multiple sclerosis can hold a criminal at bay in his home in Tucson, Arizona. A flash suppressor accomplishes nothing in the functioning of a firearm, and neither does a folding stock. This is cosmetics, and I'm glad she said so. Now, what was the question? I think we've lost it. Uh, oh, okay. We've run out of time. No, I, I think the question really was that uh, you claim to uh, 
represent uh, uh, gun, owners. gun owners of America, and yet most gun owners, according to the questioner, uh, really favor the Brady Bill and the assault weapons ban. Let's put it this way. I can r write a survey that'll have you favoring anything that you didn't like and everything and not favoring everything you like. What we're looking at is a situation in which assault weapons are believed by the American people to be fully automatic firearms. Go and ask somebody what they think it is and they'll tell you. It's a, mil it's a military firearm. They're not. There has been a great hoax played on the American people about the semi-automatic firearm. They think it's automatic. They forget the word semi in front. And when you put assault in front of it, they think it's coming out of World War II, Korea, or Vietnam. So that's why they believe that. All right, before we get to the, our uh, last question, uh, let me uh, make a couple of presentations here. <sighs> Ms. Brady, thank you for thank being you. with us. <laughs> Mrs. McCarthy, thank you. Very much. You're Coffee mug. Thank you. NPC coffee mug. Last question. The American public, I sense, is getting rather tired of this escalating and bitter Washington rhetoric over the topic of our discussion today, the gun. Is there no common ground your groups could focus on with your massive resources and manpower to achieve a solution that might benefit all the people in America? Mrs. Mataka, you can go first. Yeah, no. I think it comes down to a basic disagreement over what the Second Amendment really means. We believe it means the right to be able to defend yourself. We believe that most people in America agree with that. In fact, if you look at uh, a Newsweek, 75% of America believe that, no matter what Mrs. Brady thinks or says. We believe that it's part and parcel of a unique document called the Bill of Rights. And the Bill of Rights deals with rights of the people, individual rights, not collective rights. You start off with the First Amendment, which I'll be here to defend anybody's right until I die. But the Second Amendment comes behind it, and then we go on down all the way to number 10. If we can not agree on that basic premise, I for one don't see that we have much to agree over. We may be able to agree on mandatory sentencing, we certainly can't believe, agree on instant check. We certainly can't agree on right to carry. Every state the NRA has been in on right to carry, HCI has been right there behind us telling legislators not to vote for the citizens' right to be able to defend themselves outside their home. So I would like to be positive and uplifting and say, yes, we can agree. But it comes down to a fundamental. The fundamental is do you believe that the Second Amendment is part of the Bill of Rights and an individual right. And that's what we believe. Ms. Brady. Uh, when I first started in on this cause 10 years ago, I really did believe that one thing I could do was to try and open a discussion with, our, with the National Rifle Association and uh, have found very few areas where we do agree. Uh, they have opposed even mandatory safety training courses um, throughout the country, which to me would uh, seem like something that, that we should all be looking, looking at. Our purpose is to reduce the deaths and injuries by gun violence. And we feel and know that this can be done 
without taking away the ability of the average citizen to protect themselves, to defend themselves, to own a gun for uh, sporting or defense purposes. So basically we believe the same thing, but it, the methods by which we get to where we want to go are different. Our number one priority is saving lives and reducing injuries, and we think that can be done very easily with the support of, of the American public, which we now enjoy, and with the support of Congress and through education. Somewhere along the way, the NRA never met a gun control law they were willing to live with. And I think until they're willing to sit down and to say, this will work and that won't work, and not to fear that gun control laws are an infringement upon their Second Amendment rights, then perhaps we won't ever be able to agree. But I certainly look forward to the day when we can all work together to put saving lives in, as our top priority and public safety as our top priority. With the prospect for agreement between the two so limited, all we can sense, I guess, out of this is that the violence will go on. Thank you all for coming. Good afternoon. Thank you. Well, thank you, ma'am.